there are two commandments about coveting, about trying to get more than what the Lord desires for you to share in. It's about not taking more than our fair share and learning to be content with the blessings that God shares with us. These commandments guide us into a life of joy, a faith that God provides everything we will ever need. And so the question we will address in our summer sermon series today is a good one. Do you think bad things happen as God's payback for not leaving well enough alone? I think the baseline question here is, what if I wasn't happy enough with what God had already given me? In deciding to take things into my own hands, now I'm suffering the consequences of my decision. We all might want to know what happens when I take my desires for more into my own hands. Now that I'm suffering negative consequences, is it God who's teaching me a lesson? I think that in our moments of pain, we probably all ask this question. Well, what does our gospel reading today have to say about this? Is this sound theology? In our gospel today, we are invited to see how other people handled this issue of wanting more than they had. And we too are privileged to see how Jesus handles their desires to not just leave well enough alone. There are two miracles here in our gospel reading sandwiched together. Inside of the story of the healing, or maybe even a resurrection of Jairus' daughter, is the healing of the hemorrhaging woman. I'm going to try to pull them apart and then put them back together again so that we can see the importance of Jesus' message to his followers that hear these stories. First off, the bread. The healing of Jairus' daughter. There's this man that approaches Jesus and this deep need for his daughter. She's sick. She's dying. And he isn't willing to just leave well enough alone. He dreams of a future in which she will live and love, but something is threatening it. Is it coveting to want more than what this world is offering him? I don't think so. Is this death of his child what God wants? Definitely not. And I bet that these things never even popped into Jairus' mind when he ran to Jesus for help. He didn't care if he wanted more than what was given to him. He simply wanted life itself for his daughter. He didn't care if anybody thought that he should just accept his daughter's fate. No, he ran to Jesus, this miracle healer that he had heard about. He wasn't willing to leave this issue alone. And what is interesting for us is that neither is Jesus willing to just leave it alone. Accepting that death is just a part of life, accepting that what is happening must be God's will. Jairus believes that if Jesus will simply lay his hands on his daughter, that she will be made well. Jairus turns to Jesus for the answer, knowing that the solutions of this world will never work. Now, in this miracle story, we learn that Jairus' daughter has begun beyond any help, that she has in fact died. But as we will learn, this isn't going to affect the end of the story. As a matter of fact, because Jairus came in faith to Jesus, we see that not even death is going to stop Jesus from healing the girl. Only too late in the timeline of the world, Jesus goes to the house of the dead little girl. Unwilling himself to leave well enough alone, Jesus, with the crowd laughing at him, because people don't just rise from the dead, enters the house with the girl's parents. 
He holds her hand and with an authority that conquers even death says, little girl, get up. With these simple words spoken by the Christ, she is restored to the life that her father had coveted for her. She stands up, ready to eat and drink, ready for life to be what God really wanted for her, a wholeness, a shalom that could only come from God. And for the second or middle story, the meat of it all, the hemorrhaging woman, for 12 years, for 12 years, this woman was afflicted by undeserved pain and suffering. For 12 years, she searched out every answer she could find for relief. This woman was persistent, she was stubborn, and she wasn't willing to leave well enough alone. She wasn't willing to just accept her fate. She tried everything. But for 12 years, nothing worked. Everywhere she turned was useless. If anything, the help that the world offered her did nothing but exacerbate her problems. She was left in hopelessness, seeking a wholeness, a shalom way of life that this world just couldn't offer her. But then something new happens. There is this person named Jesus that she began to hear stories about. This healer that was able to do miracles, like even bringing healing after death. Miracles that nobody else had ever been able to do. As a work of God, she was whispered these rumors that there was finally somebody or something that could help her. In a desperate attempt, like Jairus, the hemorrhaging woman decides to run to Jesus for help. What is different for her, though, is that this is dangerous for her. She isn't supposed to be around the crowds. Hemorrhaging women were considered unclean and were forced to remain on the outskirts of town during those times in their lives. And well, this is why her actions are so inspiring. She doesn't care. She doesn't care what others think about her. She isn't willing to just leave well enough alone. She knows that if she but touches the hem of Jesus' garment, that she will experience the life that she covets. She will experience the wholeness. A shalom way of life that can only come from God. And so she breaks the law. She defies the rules. She has the chutzpah to walk right up to Jesus and take from him the miracle she knows that she can have in him. Unwilling to leave well enough alone, she basically steals a healing from Jesus. Reaching out and touching the most clean or holy thing ever in the world with her hands that were considered poisonous. Jesus felt it, asking, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it, to see who had had the chutzpah to steal this healing. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She admitted to him who she was and untouchable, suffering from a lack of wholeness, unable to experience relief from any corner of the world. Now thinking about our question today, did Jesus punish her for not leaving well enough alone? No. He instead, with merciful eyes, says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. She leaves with a new lease on life. Like Jairus' daughter, Jesus has restored the woman's life. 
these two miracle stories sandwiched together help us to see that leaving well enough alone isn't the same thing as breaking the commandments about coveting. As a matter of fact, Jesus shows us in his ministry that we shouldn't be willing to just accept what this world has given us. We have a God who wants so much more for us than what we have. Now, I do think that it may be wrong to covet a big house or a sports car that somebody you know might have, but I too think that God wants us to desire a wholeness in our lives, a shalom that can only come from God. God wants us to see that the answers this world has, like possessions, can never bring what we really need. That coveting worldly things is wrong, but seeking after the true way of life that God wants for us, that is part of our purpose in life. When we feel that yearning in our heart for wholeness, though not excess, we are told to not just accept our circumstances. When we have a real need like that for life or health, we are to run to Jesus. We can have the faith that God wants for us what we need. And even when this world wants to prove to us that all is lost, that time has expired, that in Jesus Christ that is simply not true. Jesus shows us in these miracle stories that we have a God who loves us. That in our need, when we run to Jesus, he will be there to help in the ways that our human answers never could. The purpose for these stories is for us to covet the ways of life that God wants for us. Not to accept what the world lies about and says, this is enough for you. But no, it's not about possessions like the commandments warn us about. It's about a new life, a whole life, a shalom way in Jesus Christ. In the end, one of the reasons for these miracle stories is that we may know that new life is always possible in Jesus Christ, that he has entered our life of suffering to offer us exactly this. We aren't supposed to leave well enough alone. God has something far greater in store for you than what this world could ever offer. Don't just accept a way of life less than one in Christ. God has come to make you whole. Run to him in your need. It's never too late. The ways of this world aren't what God wants either. Don't leave well enough alone because what God has in mind for you in Jesus Christ is greater than anything you have ever seen. Amen.